This podcast is Challenging Opinions and is presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading the Challenging Opinions podcast for July 23rd, 2018. The media, the way we get our window on the world, is changing at pace. In this show, I'll talk to an academic whose career is based on figuring out how the media works, how we understand it, and how it's likely to work in the future. Challenging Opinions is the podcast where ideas are tested. Whether you are left or right, conservative or progressive, devout or skeptic, What matters is the strength of your argument, not the strength of your voice. Coming up in a few minutes. We now have minimally five broadcast networks in the United States. Plus, we have basic cable, which most people now have access to. We have, you know, premium cable. Hang on, are you kidding? Hang on, hang on. Most people have basic cable. I I don't have cable TV. Nobody I know has cable TV. They just have internet. Well, okay, we're, you're, you're, fair point. We're moving back away from it. But I think the numbers still would bear me out that more Americans have basic cable than not. Mm-hmm. And that the, the download pirate services have pretty immediate access to basic cable. That's coming up in a moment. And by the way, if you can hear some noise in the background, I'm still on holidays. Right now I'm sitting on a train rolling across the plains of Eastern Europe. So sorry about the uh, slight background noises. I'm putting a lot of time and effort, even if I'm on holidays, into these podcasts. They're not interrupted with ads, I'm not promoting anybody's agenda other than my own, and I'd like to put more time into them to try to justify that a bit. I've created a Patreon account where you can donate a small recurring amount, even if it's just a buck or two, per month or per podcast. If you like the podcast and you'd like me to keep them up, I'd really appreciate it if you'd go to challengingopinions.com and follow the links to sign up as a patron. I was watching the press conference after the Helsinki summit last week, that's the would he, wouldn't he summit. I didn't really have much of a choice other than turning off the TV because I was in Russia. Still on holiday and that press conference was being carried on basically every single major TV channel including NTV and Rossiya Adin as well as all the news channels. That's not like it being carried live on CNN and Fox News. That's the equivalent of it being carried live on ABC and CBS and NBC and Fox all at the same time. And one thing to know about what goes out on Russian TV, if you're in Russia watching TV, you're watching what Vladimir Putin wants you to watch. There is absolutely no pretense of press freedom. Most of the TV channels are outright owned by the government. The Kremlin hires and fires the editors, and the content is developed in consultation with Putin's team, designed to do nothing but serve his interests. This is not new to Putin. It was true, if not so strictly enforced, under Yeltsin rule in the 1990s, and of course under the communists before him. But under Yeltsin, new TV and other independent media sprung up, offering a range of voices. It wasn't what you would recognize as totally free, First Amendment protected press, but they weren't just regime mouthpieces. When Putin took power in 2000, that trend reversed, and particularly since 2012 when Putin returned to being president after a short hiatus as prime minister, all independent broadcasting and press evaporated. The basic operating method to get independent news off the air was for a crony of Putin to offer the owners to buy the channel. Most complied. Those that didn't were hit with massive tax bills, far higher than the total value of the enterprise, forcing them to sell up. Others had greater and greater restrictions placed on their broadcasting licenses, and their owners and journalists were harassed until they complied. Once ownership was transferred, independent-minded journalists and editors were typically fired en masse, and either news content was cancelled completely, or it was replaced with slavishly obedient coverage. Within a couple of years, the operation was successful. There is now no TV coverage in Russia which doesn't take direct, detailed editorial instructions from the Kremlin. It's known that at least some journalists publish material verbatim under their own names, which they get emailed directly from the Kremlin. 
So when you see the Helsinki Summit broadcast live on all major channels simultaneously, you know that you're seeing that because Vladimir Putin wants you to see that. And Vladimir Putin clearly, desperately wants to be seen as an international statesman of renown, meeting the President of the United States on equal terms. Russia, by the way, has a GDP that's far less than the state of New York. Donald Trump went to Europe. He deeply insulted the UK Prime Minister Theresa May. With her by his side in front of the world's lenses, he praised the man who had just quit her cabinet, calling her incompetent, and said that her rival would do a better job than she would. He questioned the US commitment to its NATO allies, and he called the EU America's foes. Any one of those would be a diplomatic incident in normal times. But since this is continuous, since we don't get any break, we can hardly say the word incident. Donald Trump is one long diplomatic, I don't know, drama, farce, maybe tragedy. But Donald Trump did not attack one leader he met, just one. He clearly thinks that Vladimir Putin is his friend. He clearly thinks that Vladimir Putin is someone who would or wouldn't stoop to meddling in a US election, regardless of conclusions of the FBI or the CIA. Vladimir Putin is someone who came to power on the back of a brutal war against the tiny autonomous region of Chechnya, which was supposedly provoked when Chechen separatists bombed a series of apartment buildings, murdering hundreds of civilians in cities around Russia. Chechen separatists have never before or since used these tactics, never before or since shown the capability to launch this type of an attack or to use this type of explosives, or to launch sophisticated operations so far from their home base. And they have never varied from their line that, although they carried out other terror attacks, they had no hand in the apartment bombings. Any suspicion that the bombings were organized to give Putin a war and a platform to launch his presidency bid could be dismissed as conspiratorial paranoia. If it weren't for the fact that a Putin loyalist, the then Speaker of the Duma, the Russian Parliament, Gennady Selesnyov, announced on September 13th, 1999, the bombing of an apartment block that morning in Volgodonsk, a small, little-known city on the border with Ukraine. Selesnyov got all the details right, except for one, the timing. The bombing happened on September 16th, three days after he announced it. Opposition politicians who queried this were quickly silenced. Journalists, opposition leaders and others who oppose Putin have a habit of being murdered, often in spectacular ways that are clearly designed to draw attention to the killing. Boris Nemtsov shot on the streets of Moscow in 2015 while on his way to an opposition rally. Stanislav Markalov, a human rights lawyer, shot in 2009 by a masked gunman right at the Kremlin. Anastasia Babarova, an independent journalist, shot when she ran to help him as he was dying. Natalia Estimirova, a journalist who investigated goings-on in Chechnya, kidnapped, shot and her body dumped in 2009. Just the same has happened to Anna Polikovskaya, murdered in 2006. The same year, in London, millions of dollars of polonium was used to poison the defector Alexander Litvinenko, who died in agony weeks later after his killers were safely back in Russia. Officially, Russia denies government involvement in these murders, but they barely keep a straight face. Putin jokes how he is concerned for the health of those who cross him, but the more enthusiastic commentators on those TV channels he controls don't show any coyness. They openly celebrate the murders, and they're not contradicted, much less reprimanded. Russian troops are currently occupying territory in Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and possibly Azerbaijan also. Those countries have little hope of restoring their territorial integrity, which is exactly the purpose of the occupations. Putin has never held a job in the private sector in his life but he has vast, unexplained wealth. He wears a series of watches, each worth far more than his official annual salary.
in reality, he's certainly a billionaire many times over. It's quite likely that he's the world's richest man. For sure, he's far richer than Trump. It's normal that allies would have their differences. It doesn't take a genius to work out that Theresa May is not a good Prime Minister for the UK. It's true that NATO has leaned too heavily on US expenditure. It's true that the EU promotes its economic interests when it can, just like any other trading bloc. And it's normal to talk frankly, even harshly, to your allies behind closed doors. But to suggest that the failings of the US's allies in Europe are of the same order of Putin's is dangerous nonsense. There are some in the US who like to kid themselves that Putin is pleased with Trump's successes. That's nonsense too. Putin and his paid cheerleaders are not celebrating Trump's successes. They're celebrating his failure to distinguish between allies and enemies. Do you agree? Do you disagree? If you want your point of view heard, email podcast at challengingopinions.com and say what you think. On the line now, I have Henry Jenkins. Henry is the presenter, one of the presenters of the How Do You Like It So Far podcast. He was previously at MIT, and now he is the Provost Professor of Communications, Journalism, Cinematic Arts, and Education at the University of Southern California at Annenberg. Henry, your specialism really is new media. My real question is, can it survive? Can old media survive? And can any media survive? Well, I think history teaches us there are, there are dead delivery technologies, but not dead media. That once a culture embraces a form of communication, it tends to survive. So we might have predicted at the end of uh, the beginning of cinema that theater would disappear, or at the beginning of television that radio would disappear. And I think we can both attest that radio is as strong now as it's ever been in the age of podcasting. Mm -hmm. But how we receive radio differs tremendous, tremendously. So that listening to this podcast via earbuds, walking around off your cell phone, is a very different experience than driving a car and listening to a car radio or having an enormous cathedral radio in your living room that everyone gathers around. But radio as a medium of recorded sound persists. I think we're seeing television has never been stronger, that there's more, at least in the American context, there's more great TV than ever before. I think we can say cinema is still holding on, holding its own. Uh, news media is struggling a bit right now around the world, trying to find new business models that make sense. And yet I think the public has never been more hungry for news and traditional sources of it, sources of information. I, actually, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in one of the things you said there, Henry, because you mentioned all of those changes from listening to from the radio at home or in your car to listening to uh, a podcast on earbuds, from watching linear TV to watching perhaps downloads or Netflix. What's happened there is the live element is gone. That does not seem to have persisted. Isn't that true? Well, yes, except in sort of archaic forms, uh, award shows, sports shows, uh, live theatrical performances on television mm-hmm. or reassert- reasserting themselves at the present time, political events uh, become even something like reality television is technically not live, but there are various mechanisms which lead people wanting to watch it in real time the same time. Uh, for fear of having it spoiled. And so in odd way, while the entertainment industry sees spoiling as an enemy, it's actually an enforcement that gets people watching shows within roughly the same windows that their first broadcast and a lot and certain around certain programs. I read a book there by your former colleague at MIT, Nicholas Negroponte, and uh, this is maybe written 20 years ago. And he said that really only election results and sports results, perhaps he left out award shows. They're the only things where there's any real point to them being on linear live broadcast TV. Everything else that we're watching on TV might as well, it's recorded anyway, so we might as well have the recording than the live connection. I think there's some truth to that, but I think that leaves out the social dimensions around watching watching television. That is, insofar as television fuels conversations. If I'm in an office where 
everyone in the office was watching The Handmaid's Tale. Mm-hmm. That's a bad example because that's not – that's a uh, binge watch. Uh, let's say This Is Us. Mm-hmm. Where my office is watching This Is Us, I have strong social incentives to want to watch This Is Us when it's aired. That doesn't serve the mechanisms of streaming nearly as well since streaming is set up now to allow me to watch when I want – where I want as much as I want, that mindset is very different from one where I'm involved in an ongoing conversation with my family, my friends, my workmates, my flatmates, a fan community, where there there's strong incentives still to want to watch things as they're aired. And that, I think, is the be- biggest card in the deck for broadcast networks at the current time. I was too young to be around to watch it, but I hear that the finale of MASH was the most watched TV program ever. That's never going to happen again, is it? Well, certainly not in those numbers. I mean, there are certain broadcasts that have gotten relatively high numbers in recent years for much the same reasons. So the first episode of Roseanne in the United States, the reboot of Roseanne, got surprisingly Mm. high numbers because there was a cultural currency to it Mm -hmm. Uh, but the problem is that mash's final episode airs in a world of three broadcast networks in the united states Mm -hmm. we now have minimally five broadcast networks in the united states plus we have basic cable which most people now have access to we have you know premium cable hang on are you kidding hang on hang on most people have basic cable i know i don't have cable tv nobody i know has cable tv they just have internet well, okay, we're, you're, you're, fair point. We're moving back away from it. But I think the numbers still would bear me out that more Americans have basic cable than not. Mm-hmm. And that the, the download pirate services have pretty immediate access to basic cable programming. So if you're watching it online and not going through Hulu, but going through some channel that I really wouldn't know anything about, then you're actually probably of. still benefiting of basic, from the basic cable service and not through the streaming service. Yeah, um, I'm interested, though, in particular, and I think you hit on it, that the last episode of MASH, which I think was broadcast maybe late in the 1970s, I'm not really sure, there was also around that time uh, the television presentation of Roots and a couple of other things in that era were really generationally defining TV events. That wasn't just that everybody was talking about it at the water cooler the next day. That was something that formed a generation, wasn't it? Yeah, I think absolutely so. That's part of why culture television has mattered as a cultural force, is it becomes shared cultural capital. When we were in a world of three broadcast networks, there were any number of things like that. Uh, the pen, you know, you show your age if you start rattling off Johnny Quest or, uh, you know, the Flintstones or, you've or lost uh, Batman. You know, it depends on what age you are. But there are certain shows that you grew up with that everyone of a certain generation, and at least the American context, grew up with and knows. And that would have continued through to the late 80s. And I think that's why we're seeing now a resurgence of interest in 80s TV, both as television reboots and as quotations on things like Stranger Days and as reboots for the cinema and rebooted TV shows. That That's the last moment when that would have been true, where certain shows were virtually shared property across all the members of a given generation. Mm-hmm. After that point, things fragment. After that point, you know, we can certainly say probably everyone knows The Simpsons, which is now the longest running show on American television, but it built, it started as a fringe show on an emerging network and its persistence is what allowed it to, uh, to, to reach the level of status it is. It would have once been thought of totally as cult TV. It came from the Tracy Ullman show, a British singer who had a brief comedy show and this was an insert. Yes. I think it's possibly, The Simpsons is possibly the most successful spin-off TV show ever. Spin-off TV shows almost never work, but that one, that one has outperformed uh, its its progenitor. But putting that aside, one of the things that's noticeable with those very successful TV shows, be it The Simpsons, be it Game of Thrones, one thing is that they produce a very small number of very highly budgeted, you might argue very high quality episodes where they have literally dozens and dozens of writers, many iterations of the script. It's very dense 
and it is compared to the 1960s or 1970s TV shows where they produced maybe 50 episodes a year. That's a huge change. What is causing that is really what I'm asking about. Is there a quality demand whereby people value quality over quantity that is driving that or is that some other economic force? Well, I think we have to look where we're talking. Uh, network Broadcast networks in the U.S. are still going for the lowest common denominator and are still producing 20 to 22 episodes a year, which is less than the 28, 29 that most of them would have produced in the 60s, but still is fairly high volume. Mm -hmm. It is the streaming shows, it is the HBO shows, the Showtime programs that are taking this other model. And in some ways, it's a model we borrowed from the Brits, right? You guys had long had shorter run series with finite middle beginnings, middles and ends, uh, smaller numbers of episodes produced a year and so forth. So I think been trying to construct themselves as premium. HBO's original slogan is it's not television, it's HBO, trying to define it as something different. Mm -hmm. They've emphasized a quality audience, which is usually upscale college educated. They've emphasized density of information. They've emphasized quality of scripts and performances. And that's what people are now describing as an era of too much good TV or peak television, that there are so many shows that are writerly shows of that kind that are having an impact on television in the United States right now that people literally can't watch them all, right? None of us can keep up with the kinds of programs that are cropping out that are targeting the same audience. So this is not going to last. At a certain point, uh, it's just going to collapse in on itself because there are not enough viewers to go around for the sheer range of those kinds of shows that are being produced. I'm going to glide past you calling me a Brit and not comment on that at all. Fair enough. One thing that I want to talk about on that is the effect on news, because however the trend of having maybe lower quantity and higher quality in dramas and so forth, that hasn't happened in news. And you could say perhaps the exact reverse has happened. We've got, I've lost count how many 24 hour news networks we have. I'm not at all convinced of the quality of their output, any of them. No, I would, I would agree with you because they're, they've gone the exact opposite direction, right? They've, instead of going towards smaller product, you know, tighter productions, you know, more production time, they've gone through a 24 hour news cycle. Instead of covering a wide variety of topics, they've zeroed down on a smaller number. Instead of doing real reporting, they've pushed opinion to fill in those holes. So what we get is something that's highly speculative and often irresponsible. It moves ever forward and doesn't reverse itself or correct itself. That is comes from a position of opinion blurred as with facts that is very partisan and trying to find a niche that will watch it as opposed to trying to do down the center news for all uh, all Americans or all people around the world. So we're getting the worst of the other worst of the other side of that spectrum we were just sure, talking. Sure. But if, if there's a lot of comment, you could call that comment entertainment and that might be quality in that sense, but we're really not getting news, are we? We're not getting news and we're not getting a broad range of opinions. So you could imagine a show that was mostly talk and brought together people of a wide variety of political perspectives. And we heard from the, the, the fringes as well as from the center. We heard innovative new ideas. That could be really an exciting thing for American society. But that's not what we're receiving. I mean, if you go to the beginnings of partisan television news in America, something like William F. Buckley's firing line in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Buckley pointedly had on uh, people of really radically different perspectives than himself mm -hmm. had in-depth discussions with him, right? Thoughtful discussions where both sides listened to each other and learned because he was governed by a tradition of debate out of the Ivy Leagues that respected the exchange of differences. Again, that's not what we're seeing on American television from the left or the right. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. And one thing that I remember back to is Rupert Murdoch, who's the owner of Fox TV. He's the owner of a whole slew of newspapers. He's owner of the uh, Sky TV networks in Europe and other media assets around the world, including Australia. And he said when he was challenged about putting his newspapers online, of essentially moving from printed 
paper products that people would buy to online news that people would maybe support through the advertising that goes alongside it. He just ran the numbers and he said, there doesn't exist enough advertising in the world to support that. If you don't have a cover price, you don't have the news. Now, a lot of people might not like Rupert Murdoch, but he was right, wasn't he? Pretty much. I mean, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, I mean, particularly when you consider that for the printed media, the bottom, you know, uh, Craigslist destroyed the core base of revenue for advertising Mm -hmm. for most newspapers, which had been one ads, car ads, the exchange of everyday goods. It yeah, was they made a lot of money sections. out of that. The classified ads were where the revenue was. It wasn't the big department stores and car dealerships and so forth. Those were lucrative, but they also can use the web now to advertise themselves fairly effectively. So there is not the revenue dollars that were there for print are almost all gone. They need subscriptions. They can't. You know, and, and as long as they're giving the news away for free online, they're not going to be able to get those subscriptions. But the minute they pull themselves out of free online uh, news, they get cut out of the larger circulations and conversations of the culture, and they cease to matter as forces that people are paying attention to. So they're and caught in a one, really there's serious one There's one comment on that, Henry, that says – when you're not paying for the product, you are the product. And that really is true, even particularly with the highly partisan news, either uh, 24-hour news networks or with the highly partisan so-called news websites, really comment websites, right down to the Breitbarts and the uh, those type of websites. Their product is changing people's minds. That's the purpose that they exist for, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. Uh, and in fact, not only simply changing people's minds, but riling people up because yeah. they're finding that their stuff spreads further, gets more eyeballs, attracts more revenue. If it's controversial, if it's red meat for the Republicans, if it's, you know, heated dis- dis- disagreements, if it's petty, bic- you know, petty scandals mm-hmm. about who salutes who, all of that stuff, uh, who kneels, you know, during the sta- um, national anthem, all that stuff generates much more heated circulation. Yeah, and I don't know, Henry, if you're familiar with um, Jaron Lanier. Uh, He's a computer philosopher. He works for Microsoft, I think. Um, But he has published uh, widely on this, including a book called 10 Reasons for Deleting Your Social Media Right Now, which is quite convincing, I have to say, although I'm not going to try and convince anybody. But he gave an interview for Channel 4 Television in UK recently. And it's really eye-opening the way he explains how there's two ways to give people a dopamine hit for clicking on your website. One of them is to give them something pleasing, gives people something pleasing, but a much quicker, easier way to do it is to rile them up. And that's what's happening either automatically with Facebook or perhaps also Twitter algorithms, but for sure also with the highly partisan uh, news pro, uh, news producers. Yeah, I mean, I think Jaron is more of an alarmist than I am on this, and I see some counter pressures there that I think reverse some of that. Oh, I want to hear them. I think I think I definitely think that he's 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 describing something as a real phenomenon. I I want to hear the I want to hear the optimistic side of that because I really didn't hear it from him. No, well, I I really feel like we're, we're at the same time as we're seeing these highly divisive moves, we're seeing extraordinary abilities of grassroots networks to organize collectively. For social change. Mm-hmm. And so to me, the answer to that argument is part the Parkland kids here in the US, the, the, the victims of school violence in Florida, who have been incredibly effective at using social media to rally people across the ideological perspective in support of gun control, have been very effective at reversing some of the con- constraints of mass media and are appearing in all kinds of contexts and delivering a message that pushes directly against uh, where the money is in the culture. That is t- taking on the NRA and calling BS on the NRA as effectively as they have is a very real thing. Now, does that change the political scales? I think it's going to be interesting to see. So far, it has not moved legislation. It has not moved governmental change, but it is coalescing people who otherwise would disagree. Sure, that, that's that's possible. But are you sure that it can overcome the temptation to serve content that riles people up and just gets people angrier and angrier at each other? 
I don't know that it can, I don't know yet if it can overcome. I think it's more effective than most of the critics of the internet have suggested to date. I think there's a tendency for all or nothing for, uh, and I think we've got to take the good with the bad. I think we have to recognize that there are positive things still happening, positive things that still matter in the digital space. And we can't throw our hands up as Jared Lanier and others have been tending to do lately and saying it was all a mistake. We never should have gone down this path. Mm -hmm. I think we're in a period of difficult transition. I think we're in a period where there's a struggle over what kind of digital culture we're going to live in. And that means it's all the more important for those of us who do see positive things emerging in the digital world to call attention to them and put an emphasis on them and try to figure out what we can learn from them to be more effective in the future of combating Okay, one theory that I want that I've heard and that I want to put to you, I think I slightly disagree with it. There, it has been reported that the New York Times, since the um, current political dispensation, the New York Times has increased dramatically its number of online subscriptions. People are willing to pay money to read the New York Times online. I don't know if that's also true of, say, a newspaper like the Los Angeles Times. It is true. I've checked it out with the London Times, the Times of London, the original Times. Their subscriptions are also up. But I'm wondering if they're just outliers. I'm wondering whether the St. Louis Post-Dispatch or the Kansas City Star are getting the same uptick, and I suspect that they're not. And really my question is, it seems like nobody has found a real model for funding news in the digital age, have they? No, not so far. I, I don't think that there's a totally successful model. I think what you're, I don't know the answer to the question of how some of these other papers are faring, but if what you're saying, what you're speculating is right, and I think it probably is, then what we're seeing in the U.S., and I've been observing it for 20-something years, is a mm. shift from local news to national news as the primary way place where people get their get their information. Mm -hmm. And there are both there are both rationales for it in a world where something like 65 percent of the news in the U.S. is owned by Sinclair, which is a very right wing organization. You I mean, mean the local, local news, local news. Yes. Is, so there's a lot of there's a lot of degree to which moving away from local news is almost an inevitable development. Many new local newspapers have closed in the current economic crisis. They're the first to be hit. But it means if you want to find out anything about local candidates or state candidates uh, in the U.S., it is almost impossible to get real information about people running for mayor or running for governor in a lot of parts of the country right now. And so that movement away from local to national is going to have long-term consequences. Yeah, particularly. I mean, if you look at state, at state houses, for example, um, races for state houses and state uh, senates, they go by almost uncommented on that you, I think the awareness of even who local um, members of state houses and state senates are, people don't even know, that has left an enormous opportunity for organizations like ALEC. This is a conservative legislative exchange organization which persuades conservative members in various different state governments to pass essentially copy and paste legislation. They're making enormous legal changes right across the United States and nobody's even noticing. Yeah, I think I think the gerrymandering that's taken place in the American context, other attempts to block voting, there are other manipulations of the federal census that are being taken place on a state level, all under the cover of relative ignorance because they're no, not newspapers or news organizations in many of these areas holding people accountable for uh, the choices that they're making as governments representing these, these people. We will get every email and Facebook post from some obscure state senator that is a racist, that will get national coverage mm -hmm. in the current news environment because one side or the other is going to make an issue of it. But the actual day-to-day -to -day operations of our governments and who the candidates are is grossly underreported in the U.S. with enormously bad consequences for people. Do you have any optimism, anything, any reason to be cheerful about the future? I mean, I, I, to me, it still is about em the empowerment of the public to take accountability for their own information use and production, right? Um, that, I think, is the crucial struggle, which is why media literacy education is an important part of that. We're also seeing signs that online political participation is a good anticipator of voting behavior offline. 
and that kinds of online civic and cultural organizations such as fandoms, gaming groups, and so forth are really strong in shaping young people's willingness to participate in civic activity. So there's a younger generation coming along that I think is going to make a difference. Henry Jenkins, at least that's a little bit of optimism. Henry Jenkins is the Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, Cinematic Arts and Education at USC Annenberg. He's also the presenter of the How Do You Like It So Far podcast. Thank you very much for talking to me. I enjoyed it very much. Have you read a blog post or an opinion piece that you think is really right or really wrong? Tell us why. Email podcast at challengingopinions.com and let's discuss it on the next show. Go to the website for sources and links to Henry's podcast and other stuff we talked about. And while you're there, please like the show on Facebook, follow at Challenging O on Twitter, and follow Henry Jenkins at Henry Jenkins, and get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or topic for a future show. Also, you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone, or by email. It's all at www.challengingopinions.com. And I now have a Patreon account, so if you'd like to support the podcast, I'd really appreciate that. As I said, all the details are on the website. Coming up next Monday, that's July 30th, I'll be talking to George Marlin. He's the chairman of Aid to the Churching Need USA. That's a charity that's dedicated to helping Christians who he says are being persecuted around the world. The Challenging Opinions podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. Thank you for listening. Thank you.